Good evening, everybody, wherever you are on that lovely planet. Um, welcome to our fantastic, uh, let's say, virtual living room. Um, our guest today is Annika Björk. We're very happy to have her with us. Hi, Annika. Hello, um, hello. <laughs> Uh, it is a pleasure to have Annika with us as she is um, not only one of the most respected international CX experts and she is in that role after um, a certain time in top management positions. So she knows the talk she walks and she walks her talk. And it is very fascinating to see um, on conferences, virtual or real, um, how it is um, appreciated that she is such an open, communicative and empathetic person. One of the reasons I'm very grateful that she accepted our invitation and I would like to leave the floor with you, Annika. Tell us a bit about yourself and a bit about your career before forming CX Heroes. Well, thank you so much for, for having me and this really nice introduction. Um, very flattered. Um, as you said correctly, I spent, I actually did kind of the flip career. So I started in, in corporate world and went up the ladder quite fast and did my years in corporate management over 10 years. And then I went into consulting. So usually it's the other way around to start with consulting and then you go into corporate management. So now I started at the bottom and worked my way up. And then uh, I switched and went into consulting and I've been in consulting for the last eight, nine years or so. And as a sideline, I also uh, have been lecturing at four different universities in the last 10, 11 years now, 10 years. Wow. Oh, it's 11 already. Oh, yeah. As a um, sideline. Experience management. Yeah. Yeah. yeah just just to keep you line. busy when you're not otherwise working. Wow. Yeah. When I don't have a <laughs> and cats and everything uh, else that is going on. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, I enjoy it very much because I, I, I was um, at the University of Applied Sciences myself and I enjoyed that time very much because you, we were having the discussion with people from real business life um, and not just theory. And uh, I love that interaction with my classes that are a bachelor as well as three MBA classes every year. Yeah. And it's just forming mindset and giving back. But at the same time, I have the chance to shape mindsets of future manager or uh, managers that are in charge right now. And uh, that's, you know, that's amazing to have that opportunity. So if I need some case studies for a book that I'm not going to write right now, you are a good contact, yeah? <laughs> can be, can be. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep, that, I'll right keep that in mind. I'm, I'm constantly pushing and pushing and pushing this idea <laughs> because I have got hobbies too. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is interesting um, that you are so long in that area of lecturing and at the University of Applied Science. And I share that um, gratitude for sharing and giving back, and especially talking to people which have a dual education opportunity. Um, the topics are old. I shared the opportunity in doing this lecturing with two colleagues of mine as a network exercise. And this gave even more fun, such as um, one is an expert in healthcare, one in financials, and myself, I go for industry and generic approach of CRM at that day and e-commerce and all that. And it was inspiring to see um, when you caught their attention that um, it was a very interactive approach and exercise. Mm -hmm. And it's 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 inspiring honestly inspiring and um, um the contacts are still vivid so um even that we do not have an official alumni um group 
it's still due to social media, which is a helper there, um, an, a nice exercise. Um, so how did you move on then from lecturing, doing a corporate career and became a consultant? Um, well, the lecture I still do. Um, yeah. I still do lecture at the at the four universities. And um, where are they, the four universities? They are in Basel, Olten, Windisch, and Zurich. So you are and favoring uh, lecturing then in Switzerland? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's when I have kind of to fly back. Except we have Corona, then I can do it from here <laughs> um, <laughs> as I'm sitting on my little island <laughs> yeah, Basel is there. <laughs> and uh, I might be starting um, lecturing with the University of Applied Sciences in Edinburgh too um, so we're having some chat about that we'll see um, I guess they have the better beer <laughs> that might be true yeah that might be true yeah, well, I got acquainted in my team Brendel time uh, with uh, the brews our, they create in Basel, and we had contact to the university by the Basel, um, and uh, it was quite interesting to see how things are developed. Feldschlösschen is something I can drink quite um, in a certain amount, and... Um, yeah. There's actually a really, really good small brewery in Basel. Um, yeah. They do really, really good beer. Yeah, they're really good. Yeah. yeah. So, if you're um, there, I can recommend. Sounds good to me. So let's, yeah. let's switch to craft breweries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we were asking how I then moved on. Um, yeah. So I, I saw from consulting or being in consulting, I usually had the large scale projects, uh, you know, I was in the large corporate for maybe a year or so, leading the large CX uh, projects, either moving them to the next level or ramping off from, from zero, from scratch. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, if you go in as an external consultant, when you leave, you leave a void. Um, because it has a lot to do with change management too. You yeah. can't just focus on design and, and customer experience management. You have to integrate change management and communication and everything. So you kind of become a little bit of the, the face to the topic. Um, it's kind of natural. That's what happens. And then the, the internal team at some point, when they have the skills um, as good at, then they have to take over because you're leaving. You and the team are leaving. So that is kind of a void that, um, that you create and it's not very beneficial for, for the company and it's not very sustainable. So I then, when I decided to, um, start my own company, um, to switch from consulting to mentoring. So what mm -hmm. I do now is I support CX teams to implement customer experience management from day one on their own. I have the back, they come to me with the questions, I empower them, I give them the frameworks, whatever they need, the toolkits, but it's them doing the work within mm -hmm. the organization. I might do a training so I can show them how to hold that training, how to do it, what is important, um, but then they do it. And honestly, what they need is just like this much advantage in knowledge compared to the rest of the organization and compared to to management right and then they're able to walk so it's kind of like having you know like with my little daughters learn or teach them show them how to walk how to use things uh, cutlery whatever and then at the beginning it's you know a very um intense um collaboration where i i meet them every week but as months go on, it becomes less and less and less because they're just able to do the things on their own and they get it and um, they're able to empower other people in the organization. And that's very rewarding for myself as well as for them because I can see the joy that comes up in doing it in the pride they have because they're able to do things on their own. And that's just beautiful to see. So the goal is to make myself redundant at some point, ideally, um, even mm -hmm. though usually they come back on a regular basis because they encounter new problems and have to get to the next level or management has a next request or expectations or whatever. 
So um, I, I love that switch. And that's how I got to starting the CX Hero School because I can, you know, be with a few teams at the same time and that's very limited. And there's so many tools and, and courses and things and knowledge that are always the same. So I'm putting that online um, one after the other and I'm starting collaboration with other experts. Um, so they bring in their knowledge too, and we pair it to CX and um, the platform is growing fast with knowledge and toolkits and resources that a CX manager can use at any moment and, you know, help them be practical because in the CX industry, we're just so philosophical about the entire discussion. We, we're discussing about, you know, customer centricity and the management mindset and, and the right score. But how about getting down to work and, you know, get into the trenches and do the dirty work? <laughs> um, and right. the practical things are the things that are missing. So that's, as you can see, I'm very passionate about. <laughs> as are we. I'm glad that you mentioned uh, the divide between uh, you know, how we think about CX and how we put it into practice because it makes me wonder about how you came to consulting from management. And I've always wondered about that. Um, many years ago, I was commissioned to put together a book, a guide for people trying to get into management consulting, uh, for people coming out of university. And sure, I did it, but it didn't quite make sense to me because why would you want to hire a consultant for your business who has never been in business before. It make, it always has made much more sense to me if you want people who understand the problem to try and solve the problem. Absolutely. Right? I mean, how has that been? And I, I assume that that has been something you've encountered and wondered about as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just read um, an article today coming from McKinsey. Um, and I had a, a colleague of mine, another CX expert, commenting on no wonder um, about McKinsey not being able to, you know, get CNN, CNN uh, plus to fly. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. yeah, that's exactly the bit of the problem. It's like overcomplicating things because we there's so much in head and, and concept and strategies and whatever. And it's like, even in CX, then you have this beautiful CX, whatever concept strategy, but it's not implemented. And the implementation is what the hard work is. It's where, you know, the truth comes out and you have to adapt to the organization. It's like, I've seen so many concepts in those 10 plus years in, in management, in the financial um, world. They went from door to door, from company to company, selling the same strategy. They were all on the same projects and just, you know, it's copy paste and change the logo. I'm being a bit, you know, with you, but that, at the, you know, <laughs> bottom line, that's what they're doing. And that's the problem when you, you know, you haven't been in the business and you're like, yeah, everybody's ducking their head and waiting for it to pass. And you need someone, as you said correctly, I totally agree with that, that has been in the field, that knows the industry, and then is able to adapt such a concept idea, if it's really good, to the company itself. And someone once said, um, if someone tells you there's a change, a standard um, for change management, standard framework, I think, then it's either a liar or a consultant. And it's so true for so many <laughs> strategies and concepts. It's like just trying to standardize it up across companies. It's just not going to work. It's not going to work for CX. It's not going to work for change. It's not going to work for strategies because every company is different. And you need someone that, you know, understands a company, is able to adapt things to that company, um, or otherwise it's just going to go down. I would never say I utilize a framework as I am too much an emulated Swiss in that, I'm going for the Swiss multi uh, tool, such oh. as Swiss Army Knife. I am working with a toolbox, and mm -hmm. the toolbox allows me to do a mass customization approach 
um, fit to their needs. That is a lot more fair in having all the experience of years of consulting different organizations, which this uh, different state of ripeness and um, where you catch them and where you can address them and where it is either that small little step forward or that the train the trainer approach is getting a bit larger yeah mm -hmm. but i love the approach that you simply teach them how to walk or to cycle their bike yeah yeah and exactly. then they cycle for themselves exactly yeah and then the next stage is going to be the downhill or you know mountain biking or whatever it's you know it keeps evolving when maturity grows, then there's going to be other needs um, and other, you know, development that they're, they're going to take. In um, talking to organizations and looking to those which are the decision makers in a buying center, hmm. who are your, uh-huh, yeah, I touched the right point. Just start talking. <laughs> No, no, ask your question. <laughs> no, I, I already saw on your face that um, the, the intention to go forward on touching that um, big bunch of non-existing knowledge and finding somebody who is willing to support the first steps so that they can ride the bike yeah, together with your help. Well usually what a lot of cx professionals try to do or prospects when they're starting off is trying to selling cx as a whole as a as a philosophy almost and trying to convince management so they're pushing very hard um the topic and i did the same mistake too uh, at the beginning and luckily i had my mentor telling me back then it was 2000 eight i think he was actually sitting in san francisco so quite close to um <laughs> to you guys um and he was like you're just gonna you know the more you push the more you're gonna get pushed back um and the only way it really works is to find someone that believes in the topic um yeah. and is willing to you know, invest a little bit of his budget or take a risk to do a project. So try to find someone within the organization. For me back then, it was my kind of peer colleague in claims. He just got it. He, he you know, on a mental level, he just got it. And <laughs> he, he was kind of my testing um, buddy where we would do things with his teams that he had and then we started having results and we took it from there and at some point we were like we had a new ceo so um we knew okay we have a chance now to place this topic and we've been working on it um a bit over a year and we kept having um one-on-ones with the new ceo um, I was head of quality management and he was head of claims and not in uh, the board of directors. And then we were like, either this is going to work out and one of us is going to be in the board of directors or we're going to get kicked out <laughs> because we really started doing bigger things and being more pushy. And he ended up being in the boards of directors. Um, so it worked out and I got the big project. It came on, on the management agenda and everything, but it's not because I pushed from the very beginning to try to get the big project. Um, we just did step-by-step -step little projects and show the results next one, show the results. And it was just because I had one person that became kind of my, my CX peer or team buddy. And then we were able to take it from there. And there's this kind of person everywhere in any organization you just have to find him and then work with this person and take it from there they have budget they have their teams there's so many things you can do um just don't think too big don't over engineer just stay simple that is a very important sentence you just mentioned yeah find your partner in crime step one find a leveraging edge where he has some pains and you 
know that you can help and then win him. And then we come to the next step. That is, um, how do you convince then from further on, um, are there specific KPIs you're watching through? Because we had that interesting discussion started from Peter Pirner and some others. What are you going for the ROI of CX? And uh, this was quite fascinating to see that um, this developed in a quite propelling exchange of thoughts and ideas. I missed that one, unfortunately. I'm going to have to to look it up. Um, Me too. It... <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, I, and, I, and I did the preceding interview with him. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so you missed the propelling. Yeah, I missed the propelling. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, I feel an hour like... too early. <laughs> yeah. um, I feel like there is an over engineering there too. Um, honestly, you know, that's what I say. We we need to to do our work and deliver business cases for every project we do and that's quite simple and straightforward to do the only thing the only big mistake that a lot of cx professionals try to do is to link the feedback measures like the yeah. nps whatever score mm -hmm. you take um and try to link it to finance and that's not going to work it's like there's no link i mean just mathematically it's not possible unless you have a big research proving over years how much revenue increase you get out of i don't know how many detractors you lose or you know you changing into into promoters the other thing you can do is to put um kpis or link the two like the feedback to um behavior of kpis like mm -hmm. share of wallet and all that list yeah, yeah. And then link it to finance so you need that link in between and then mm. you're able to do it and the return on cx is nothing else than sum up all the project that you've done and then you have to return on cx but if you if you don't have your business cases if you're not measuring your stuff in your project then you're not going to able to do it it's just mm. as simple as that and if you try to say well all the changes on the mps is because of cx sorry that's bs too because it's not there's so many projects going on there's so many movements it's so volatile you're gonna get ripped apart if not from the ceo then from the cfo because he knows a bit more on stats probably than mm -hmm. the others so it's very shaky ground um and i would never advise to take those figures to make your financial case on the return on CX. So take what you're doing and try to convince and to show the numbers there and then sum it up. That's your return on CX. I, I don't see why it should be so super complicated and why everyone is over engineering there. I love yeah. that approach because it helps to see to happy faces because they achieved something which is a benefit to them which is a benefit they see there is something going forward for their customers and you can build on that on a positive experience and that makes it from my perspective um, interesting to ask you how employee experience is liaised with customer experience i love that topic <laughs> oh, yeah. a, i knew we were going to get there sooner or later i'm glad we did it now you will be, you'll become Esteban's favorite enemy. <laughs> and he has a long list of them. Oh, well, but not that many favorites. Um, so that I think that's a bit the thing in our industry. We're over engineering so many things. So for a lot of people, employee experience is a lot about employee happiness like in a nutshell, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, putting up color carpets and a swing or I don't know what. Um, so snacks, like, the break room. Mm -hmm. snacks yeah. and apples and I don't know what, which is nice, which is great. But 
it does not push employee engagement to where you need it to be. Um, there, there's so much more behind employee engagement than apples and swings and color carpets and Google offices. Um, and it's more than just, you know, having a meaningful job and all of that stuff. There's so many variables that come in there. And there's a few good concepts on how to measure employee engagement. And it, the link to CX, what you were asking, is actually, if you look at the value chain of a company, CX is just the last link, the very last link between customer-facing teams and the customer. That's, mm -hmm. in a nutshell, what CX is. Everything else in the value chain is EX. And yeah. I don't understand why we're watching on EX from a satellite perspective and thinking that's just one. Because EX is everything which is happening in that value chain. How engaged are the employees? And how customer-centric are the employees? And not towards the end customer, towards their internal customer. Because only if they are customer-centric towards their internal customer, the customer-facing team are going to be able to live that customer centricity towards the customer itself. Otherwise, what is going to happen is that we have some value or some target experiences that we expect the customers to experience. We expect the customer facing team to put in place, but it's like a theater. It's like a Muppet theater because that's not what they're receiving within the organization. And that's very hard to do because they won't believe in those values, but they're, they're not living them. They're not receiving them. So that's why it's so important that customer centricity is something that is within the entire organization. All those target experiences, all those beautiful words and values, they have to be lived within the organization, especially in the value chain. And that's something that can be measured and that's something that can be put into goals too. I'm not saying don't put MPS goals to, to employees, but just to the last chain within the value chain. And for the rest, meaningful um, goals is customer centricity within their organization, the feedback they get from the, their internal customers. And that's when you start really working on EX because then they have the power, they have the responsibility, they see the changes and there's beautiful tools that you can put in place to, to promote that, to, to make that stronger. Now the obvious, question is why is amazon then a high cx company because they don't care too much about ex that's a good question um <laughs> great <laughs> <laughs> i i always find it hard to compare um those greenfield companies to the long-term company, especially greenfield digital companies to the long-term companies with, mm -hmm. you know, long, I mean, old, long, proper value change, like, I don't know, a Swiss railway mm -hmm. or yeah. insurance or something like that. Yeah. Um, I think what Amazon excels at, really excels at, is at the last link in the value chain. They're really, really good at that. Um, far better than anyone else probably in the world. Um, and they're able to manage that from like just that last link that they have in the chain. And it doesn't really matter much what is happening in the back because either it's technology or technology-based or automized and whatever. I mean, mm. the packages are being put together by some robots and whatever. Um, at some point. So I, I don't know, I haven't seen within, you know, the organization. So it's hypothesis from my side. Mm -hmm. um, they're just able to control that um, so that the customer doesn't feel it. 
Yeah. Which then is probably similar to a company that puts its fate on automation. Question mark. Because, well, the more you automate, the, the lower the number of involved people. Means yeah, EX eventually, become, I don't EX think it becomes would... irrelevant. Yeah, well, I think that depends on the industry. I'm sure there's industry where that is possible um, mm -hmm. doing. Um, and I'm very sure there is a lot of the industries where that is mm -hmm. not possible, where it is a nice extra, um, or you mm -hmm. can automate some processes mm -hmm. that are, you know, either not fun for employees to do, or a lot of mistakes, or mm -hmm. just the 80% that are always the same. Um, that's great. If you can do that and it's a great experience for the customer, mm. then awesome. That's perfect. But mm. from what I see, a lot of those automations, not that. No, no, no. Well, they, they, often do, they, they often don't do the job. That's yeah. fine. fine exactly. with, that's that's yeah, fine. They're automatic, me, they're fast, and they're the, wrong. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if they fail fast, yeah. But the point that I will wanted to make or the question that I actually ask is if I'm able to automate it then this dealings EX with CX from CX is automation yeah possibly depends where you're automizing if you're automizing mm -hmm. the la last link in the in the chain then yes but possibly mm -hmm. you're automizing something within the organization too if you yeah, look at the yeah. job to be done approach and see that you kill time consuming or time killing stuff and reduce that due to automation mm -hmm. to allow more sophisticated, more skillful jobs to happen, then you can follow your motto, bring um, a little more joy to people a little more joy mm -hmm. to employees such as yeah, yeah. they are no longer doing the garbage work but going for the things they would love to do and where they could deliver benefit their skill in some extra for better processes uh, better customer experience mm -hmm. um ease yeah, in other departments I was just thinking the same because I have a project right now with uh, with a company where we're looking at automizing the or oh, some of the questions coming in from customers so that they're replied automatically and 80% it's just always the same so it's so frustrating for customer service mm -hmm. to having to answer those questions over and over again 100 times a day um, so it's actually when it comes to EX for mm -hmm. the employees, mm -hmm. it's going to be an upgrade because the only messages they're going to get are the ones that actually mm -hmm. need a human being with a working brain to, you know, do some proper job and the rest, it's going to be the machine taking mm -hmm. care of it. Um, so seeing from a perspective from EX, that's going to be a better experience. Um, well, as, as the automation sucks, <laughs> like we just <laughs> found out, <laughs> the CX is going down, then let's just stick to this. I'm, I'm just, what, what I'm trying to f figure out is what the actual link between improving EX and CX is. There is so much controversy around that. Some people are saying there is none. Others are saying it's so obvious. And yet other people are standing somewhere in the middle. And I... Well, I'm just confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe this can help. When um, when I was in um, to the land of when, confusion. <clears throat> land of, no, well, we'll see. Um, <laughs> what is possible to do if you if you measure the let's say the EX or employee engagement and the customer centricity? Uh, mm. I wouldn't say that's EX. EX goes a bit. Maybe it is. Something to think about. But okay. if you take the customer centricity, so no, let's start in the other end. Take the employee okay. engagement. You look at the team. Oh, you see the employee engagement. If they're happy, unhappy, stressed, whatever. Um, and then you look, 
you look at the customer centricity within the value chain. So you look at actually the vectors, the, the, the links between the teams, how well are they working? If you measure that, you're actually able at some point to predict an NPS, the score that the customer mm -hmm. has potentially. So I did that over several years when I was in, um, in financial management and I, we measured the customer centricity every three months within the organization and um, the employee engagement every year. And we were able to predict by six months the NPS that we would get from customers. So for me personally, there's definitely a link there. Mm -hmm. If for whatever reason, the measures go down in EX, you can see the NPS, the, the customer is going to follow six months later. But EX not being just employee happiness, but more. Yeah being real customer centricity, being real employee engagement, then yes, then it's a predictor. Mm -hmm. But if it's just about, you know, playing I football. I enjoy very much that approach because uh, what I threw into the crowd on LinkedIn in that ongoing discussion was, for instance, that I only found um, out of the year 2000 and so, so, so 20 years ago, an empirical study from a professor and his team in India, where they uh, did a proper research on the topic, how EX is influencing whatsoever. And um, it is quite um, compelling that the academical approach has not, due to our research, um, the three of us, been too hard on that aspect, how EX is influencing CX, and everybody is um, voting for his gut feeling, his experience, and the positive mood. Uh, and it's not the fruit baskets, uh, you're absolutely right, but it is um, that you have done something pragmatically plausible, um, which is clear to, uh, as you phrased it, a uh, normal thinking brain. Um, if you get that shit away, and they have time for something more useful, then they are getting a bit more engaged and enthusiastic, and this will pay off. Yeah. So if you, instead of playing um, a tape or an automized machine, and you can catch your caller and say, oh, just let me play number five, <laughs> such as you have this uh, as these sound generating machines with uh, Mr. Raab or some famous TV shows that they just push a button for a noise. So you could pre-record the answer and then he can hang up and say, any further questions out of my standardized 52? Uh, <laughs> or do you have something thrilling, new, and where I can honestly help just not playing the tape? Um, say this. I believe there is... Um, out of your practical experience, you just mentioned that it is important to get people into engagement, into motivation. Um, we worked on the part that um, take away that shitty work and get some others. But are leaders, are managers, male or female, really engaging in a motivating way do they still know how to give appraisal and recognition? Motivating is one thing. Um, praising recognition, no, we're scared of that. Most managers are kind of feel like, oh, if you praise someone, then I'm, I don't know, stupid. Or, weak or Yeah, exactly. Even worse, he wants more money. Or need my position, it's my turn. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. Um, which is sad because we all have this deep, deep need for praise and recognition, not because we are wounded or something like that, or something didn't went wrong in our childhood. <clears throat> we want to be seen um, and we want to know that we have a safe spot within a, a tribe and that yeah. is actually our survival mode. Um, we 
we know we can survive in a tribe and chances are quite slim to survive when you're on your own. So everything which is negativity, critique, um, is yeah. something that stresses us. And um, we actually, you can see that we have cortisol coming up in, in the body. And uh, it's something that is felt really, really strongly because we have this fear of being kind of kicked out of the tribe. Um, so we get that on a regular basis and it actually stays for quite a long time. And then maybe once in a blue moon, we get a praise or reward. <laughs> Um, and that doesn't balance out. Um, so we're actually unnecessarily stressing employees just because we have kind of this thinking that praising people is is not good. And I totally agree, overpraising uh, is not the goal, but it has to be honest and authentic. And if someone did something good, then tell them that, recognize that, show, you know, be grateful or... Um, as I um, put on my six year school, give them a praise card, a, a little note, whatever, um, but make it authentic because that's going to make your team more successful and more engaged and um, they're going to deliver a lot better work. It's simple tricks, but yeah. they go a long way and they work really, really well, but just because that's the way our brain is wired and it's been wired like that for a, you know a few thousand years and uh, it's not going to change just because you know management nowadays for the last i don't know 100 years thinks that's not the right, right way to go i catch for the appraisal cards uh, as um, you are delivering in one of your um web page approaches these appraisal cards as an idea um, so that people can get some ideas. But what I learned from my wife, which was in the former days before we um, had the pleasure to get three kids um, in a large three-letter company, which is known for hardware, an American one. And she said, well, um, the motivating parts is when you get a voucher for a dinner for two because you did something good. Or mm -hmm. if you have your feedback month yearly appraisals or quarterly appraisals, that it's not the bullshit bingo on going to a questionnaire, but that you have a boss who takes himself the time to give you an honest reflection mm -hmm. and is offering you help in areas where he honestly and authentically found room for improvement, not mm -hmm. just to batch you, but um, not the limblick Neanderthaler, but um, more um, the non-caveman style in the way such as, I know that you have talent. I know that you have skill. It's like we would like to wake the princess or the prince in you and make you shine and rise. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see if we can develop this. Yeah. I think that's when you're uh, sorry. That's when you brain you're open to, to get that. You know, you you're open to take on that feedback because when you bash that in the brain, what happens? Your prefrontal cortex just shuts down, and you don't hear it. You you're in survival mode. I mean, it sounds you know very extreme, but at you know at a brain level, that's what Probably happens, is, yeah. and it doesn't go anywhere. You're not going to adopt it. The modern time Fleischkärtchen and Bienchenkärtchen out of school are now the vouchers for something they give for you just to show you if they are not as creative as you are with these appraisal cards. Thank you for doing a good job. Yeah. And what I personally would like to see is that more people are taking that enthusiastic path to motivate so such simple measures and taking the hand you are giving them and um, showing them how easy it can be to do a nice appraisal and that they with that leverage the self-motivation streams and the enthusiasm in their teams. Then from that, in the EX experience, I'm a believer. I can't prove it. I can't measure it. 
I just feel it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm one of these um, Isaac awesome guys touching my heart and knowing, um, yeah, really there is something happening. Yeah. You can really, it, it's like you push a trigger. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and there's even science behind it. So there is research around yeah. that, um, that shows. And actually the sad part is if you look at, you know, people being, bashed or yelled at or whatever what happens in the brain is exactly the same as if you're hitting them mm. you know mm. imagine that it's you're just slapping them it's just the same thing it's just with words but in the brain it happens like exactly the same thing so we need to rethink how we talk to people how we you know bring up our, even when we have a criticism not to bash people down because we could just as well slap them and it's just not okay it really is not and the funny thing is the praise cards um actually what i really used them for i had them always on my table i printed them out you can print them with a visit card printer you can print them super easily um i had them on the table and actually that was the most important part is that they were always there and every friday i would think through my team and think of the people that did something special or something amazing, something good, yeah. and just write that praise card and putting it on their desk so they would find it on Monday morning, first thing they would come into the office. Got it. And mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's super simple. It's so easy. Yeah. And you don't need to have a praise card for that. You can take a piece of paper. Of course, it's nice if it's designed nicely and you have the values of the company on it or whatever. But, you know, you can even just take a piece of paper and put it on the desk or do it with an email or whatever digitally nowadays. Small improvements. It's the name of a tool that does exactly that. <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm still confused. So I get all of that. What I do not get is where the link to CX is. So how do I correlate it? I now improve my EX by N percent. How do I correlate that? If I want to, well, the goal is improved CX via improved EX. Now I improve my EX. How do I get a measure for improved CX? And then further on, what's on my bottom line to get the CFO happy and the CEO, of course. And appending on to his question, do you need a measure for it? Yeah, yeah, because one, yeah, one of the things that comes You're way up, too smart, Marshall. <laughs> yeah, seriously, yeah. right? We talk about the numbers a lot. And yeah. of course we do because business runs on numbers. We're concerned mm. about the top line, the mm. bottom line, the money, the operating efficiency. But while there is the statement that you can't manage what you can't measure, there's yeah. also... Uh, you know, the Demings, you know, William Edwards, Demings, uh, diseases of management. One of them is running your business only on visible figures. Mm -hmm. You know, do you need to be able to stick a number on EX and CX to improve it? So I guess why do you want to answer improve me it? or answer Thomas yeah. or both of yeah. us? Why do you but, want to improve it? Then would be the follow up question. <laughs> Now you have placed three questions and the lady hasn't had a chance to answer. Yeah, but she's got 10 whole minutes. So. Yeah. <laughs> Take your time. But well, we still miss the five CX uh, tips. Don't huh? add on to other questions. <laughs> I think we're going to have a second session, Raul. Oh, yeah. Um, no complaints. Because this is getting so. philosophical here. Um, well, Marshall, I'd like to start with um, the, the, your question, like the end line. And the problem is, do you really have to, to measure everything? Well, what's the opposite of it? The opposite of having a measure and being able to prove things is believing in it. That's what you're left with. Mm -hmm. And you might believe in CX, you might believe in God, but there's still discussion. <laughs> If CX brings something or if there's God. Yeah. And that makes 
your life as a CX manager a living hell? Because that's, you know, you keep having that philosophical discussion of trying to evangelize people to believe in CX. It's mm -hmm. a nightmare. I've been there. It's a living nightmare. The best way is to prove that you have a result out of it. And the best way to prove it is doing project by project by project by project and showing the effect. And mm -hmm. ideally, later on, when you're a more mature organization, you have other teams doing project by project by project and then showing the effect. So at the beginning, you're this tiny, small, little gravitation field. And ideally, over time, you, you're able to you know, pull in more people and um, having a bigger effect, not because you have more resources, but because you empowered other people. Mm -hmm. um, and then to, to your question, Thomas, um, is it possible to link it like the one to the other? It is possible if you do your, your research properly, like, um, one thing is having the results out of the single projects. That's, in my opinion, the return on CX um, as a sum, because that's mm -hmm. what you're working on. That's the result. Mm -hmm. That's really what you've been doing. It's my personal opinion. Maybe I'm going to change it in a year because someone brings up another uh, mm -hmm. smart concept. But for the time being, that's my belief. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is having a measurement and a tool which is gives orientation to mm -hmm. what do we need to work on and to link that to the finance is kind of tricky and shaky um, because you know today how the experience is and you want to improve it mm -hmm. so maybe over time you have the, the data and you can do your regression on it but you need time and you need to collect mm -hmm. the data for that. Um, so to link CX and, and EX, as always, EX being you know a proper solid foundation along the mm -hmm. value chain, then you're able to link it because you just link mm -hmm. one, um, one chain link after the other. So you know exactly what the figures are in every step of the value chain. And you know what the biggest, um, it, the most important deliverables are and what the most important yeah. values are that you want them in their experiences to feel. So, for example, when I was in the insurance company, one of the big, big, big problems was the quality of documents. Mm -hmm. They were a nightmare. Every organization, every um, unit was doing their own documents. And... For, for customers, it was a nightmare. They didn't understand the thing. They looked completely differently. And for so many years, we, we were talking about it and saying we need to do something. But from management perspective, it was always a soft fact. So they never they were never willing to invest in it because there's no outcome. If you change the documents, what are you going to gain? We started measuring the quality of the documents along the value chain. And we saw that we, where the problems were and who was putting in a lot of time to fix those documents to make the CX better. Um, and in, uh, in the car insurance, the um, invoice that went out to customer was a one-liner saying, your car insurance is 748 Swiss francs. That was it. No explanation, no details, zip, nothing. And within the measurements in the value chain, we saw that the second last link in the value chain was having a huge problem with that because the customers would call the sales reps. The sales rep would then call them and ask them for the details. So the entire organization in mm -hmm. fall was spending days and weeks in the systems and with excess spreadsheets to write down the details of that invoice and send it to customers. So I took that that case. I took the time they took to do that times mm -hmm. the entire organization of three and a half thousand people um, every fall, and I had my project. We changed it. Numbers went up, 
and the MPES went up. So you can find mm -hmm. your cases within the value chain and mm -hmm. then you can prove it's definitely linked one to the other because you can prove mm -hmm. exactly quality of documents going up and then you mm -hmm. have the, the, the effect on, on the MPS and the customers too. Same thing happened when they started changing the organizational structure to what it was into a front office, back office system. Mm -hmm. and nothing was working from technology side and the entire numbers in different units were plummeting um, because of that change six months later the mps numbers were plummeting mm -hmm. so okay. the what, was really high what you're basically saying is first that nps may be a good starter to look at Second, what you're, what, what I heard, yeah. So I might, might, might be wrong. Second, what I heard, so the different industries uh, with their different val internal value chains have different correlations between CX and EX. Even furthermore, it depends on where the employee in the value chain is, and mm -hmm. then it's even business, mm -hmm. Bus individually. Uh, individual to specific to the particular business in question. Yeah, exactly. Um, which, which now might just as a closing statement for, from my end for this part, which also might explain why Amazon is so successful because they might just be good to their people where, where those people, where they think those people matter, maybe. Yes, no question about it. Could be. Um, I really have, I really don't have much insights when it comes to yeah, don't have as well. it's just a theoretical chain of conclusions right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Could be exactly. Mm. And the, the, the funny thing is, if you actually analyze the value chain of companies, mm. um, I analyzed two companies that were same size, same industry, same color of the logo, mm. um, similar values and stuff. Mm -hmm. And you look at the value chains and they're completely different. And you can read out of, sorry, my cats are going ballistic. <laughs> you can read out of that analysis of the value chain mm -hmm. that the one company has a complete different culture. They're so afraid of making mistakes that everyone talks to everyone all the time. And they're kind of stopping themselves from being efficient because everyone is mm -hmm. so scared of making a mistake. Right. While the mm -hmm. other company um, has a completely different setup and a way better streamlined value chain, which would, mm -hmm. should actually look, you know, like this, because you have the customer here, you have probably one, two, maybe five uh, customer facing teams. And mm -hmm. then the entire organization in the back is spreading out with all their processes and things happening. And the very funny part mm -hmm. is very often the processes don't match the value chain. Mm -hmm. It's just, the things that are documented in the processes are just not the same thing as the live living value chain, like how people work together. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to a highly important question. As the top of the hour is approaching fast, how much time do you have left? Me? <laughs> yeah? You. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I don't have my daughter. It's nine o'clock in the evening. Um, I'm not going out anymore. I do have some fun left. <laughs> All righty. We are not known for. We are not the punctual people. We are not Prussians. <laughs> um, we go for the fun part, and this comes back to me being the advertiser and promoting that we would share at least for some minutes five strategies to achieve impact and visibility for projects and the organization and their customers on the CX path. So the floor is yours, milady. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very kind. Um, yeah, so that's what we were, um, we were discussing in, yeah. in our chat too. Um, and um, the first big course that are also put into the CX Hero School because I've seen so many in my mentoring, so many CX um, managers fail in their projects. Um, and I had especially one um, lady, um, her name is Katie, and she 
I felt really sorry for her. She had this beautiful project in mind and actually got her budget. And then she got like torn apart in a meeting with the board of directors. And she was so gutted after that. Um, so we put everything back on track. And that was the point where it's like, we're all talking about CX, about design, prototyping, research, customer journey mapping over and over again. I can't hear it anymore. Um, what personas are, you know, are there and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But we're losing sight of doing proper project management. And actually CX project have a certain twist to it that if you don't know it, you're just gonna get into or fall into some pit pitfalls. So my okay. advice, my five strategies, which are important in CX projects is first and foremost, don't get lost in the CX bubble. We have the tendency because we love CX is to oh dwell in that in that cx bubble and design and do our prototyping and uh, you know again and over and talk to the customers and all of that the problem with that is that it delays the delivery of results mm -hmm. until we through that phase we don't have results to show and managers are used to the old style project so they have this gut feeling for when should we see some results? When should I feel, see mm -hmm. something changing? When should I get the first feedbacks or people complaining? Um, but that takes a lot, a lot more with CX projects, especially if we try to do it perfectly and we iterate three, four, five, six times and talk mm -hmm. to customers over and over again. So pay attention not to dwell all too long in that, mm -hmm. in that CX bubble and keep moving fast, especially in that design phase. Then CX project have six and not the classical uh, four phases. So in classical projects, we have a definition phase and a planning phase, which is usually quite fast. Then we go into implementation and then there's the completion phase where, you know, they um, have their dinner and uh, their drinks and whatever. And that's, you know, how a project ends, right? Party. Um, have, huh? Party. Mm -hmm. Everyone happy. Yeah, exactly. Until they figure out that they have to reverse engineer stuff because they didn't talk to customers or because some things are not working and whatever. Um, and in CX projects, ideally, you have the setup phase where you start um, researching the potential KPIs that you might want to measure. Because that's the problem. We don't know at the beginning of the project, we're not able to do the business case as it would be in a normal project during the definition, you do the business case, right? Um, because you know exactly what you're going to do and how you're going to measure it and all of these things. You don't have that in the CX project. That's the tricky part. So what you need to do at the beginning is we're going to work or work with hypotheses. What kind of behavioral KPIs might change during the project um, and do that setup. Then go into design uh, phase, do your research, do your prototyping, and then do a pilot project. So test it out on a small scale, because just with the prototype, you know the feedback on that specific deliverable, but it's not implemented in real processes. You need to test it within the organization. So with a pilot project, you can test your prototype. Is it really working with the processes that you have and it's small enough to do manual workarounds? And you're able to do your first measurements because you do a zero measurement before and then a next measurement after you've done the pilot project. So you have, you see which KPIs are moving and you see how they're moving. And you can compare it to teams where you didn't do anything. So you can separate your success from the success of other teams and take that out of the equation. And then you're able to build your, your solid business case that every CFO is going to sign on and you can take it to the next stage and get approval from board of directors or sounding board or whoever is deciding <laughs> to go on with the rollout of your project. So only then you get the approval of the if you try to get that beforehand, it's going to be really, really hard because it's a lot of hypotheses. It's possible, but it's really, really hard. 
Then you go into implementation, you do the next measurements, and you can show and prove your success. And then you go into completion, and ideally you start setting up a CX monitor. So every project that you've done, all the KPIs, you get them into a monitor, you keep measuring them because you want to see if someone something changes, and that can be the customer's behavior or the customer's need, you want to see when you have to step in and rework on your journey, touch point, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Then the third thing is CX projects trigger uncertainties um, that you have to manage. What we often expect is, you know, or what I hear is this, the management doesn't get it. The management is not customer centric enough. What we come in with a new framework with new methodologies and we expect them to get it right away. Mm -hmm. um, but they have their modus operandi, their way of working. And I always question them, how customer or how management centric are you then? We're bringing in something which is cross-functional, um, very new to them. Um, and we need to manage with communication, with stakeholder management, where they're at and try to move them forward. So instead of trying to communicate once, oh, we're doing CX, or this is what we're doing, this is the budget we have, um, is to follow them through and you know take them from A to B, from a mindset, mindset perspective too. And that's something that a lot of people, a lot of CX managers don't do. They don't manage that properly. They don't do stakeholder management. They don't do um, proper communication management. Um, as stated before, we worked with the hypothesis um, for the business cases. Um, that's really, really important and works smoothly and really, really well, especially with uh, financial guys, because then they can, you know, they have real hard facts they can work with. And the last strategy, the fifth point is um, only if you do that, you're able to really prove your success. And that's really important. Only if you measure what you're doing and the KPIs that are changing, then you're able to divide your success away from everyone else's success. Because what happens is when you're successful, you might have a hundred other projects going on in, in the company. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to claim that success. You have to prove that it's yours. Because if you can't prove it, it's gone. And mm -hmm. you're back point where you have to believe in CX, mm. but you had your project. So make sure that people don't have to believe in it anymore. People have to prove that CX is working. And that's only possible if you, if we measure it. I have a question. There were two abbreviations in the sheet, which I do not, um, um, by the first sight, manage to um, encrypt. The one is, um, yeah, well, uh, Decrypt, yeah, yeah, com and SHM. Um, Communication and stakeholder management. Ah, grazie mille. Prego di niente. <laughs> okay. So after this good explanation of the five strategies, I think we can't top that anymore for today. <laughs> so, which makes these five strategies the perfect time to have a go discuss when, when we when we meet next. <laughs> yeah, and for instance, uh, I need and, 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 and to show yes, the cats. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> very happy. Yeah, to like be running all over the place. <laughs> And to show the cats even more. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. one. There we are. Oh, there we are. Ah, meet the cat's eyes. Cook, cook. Oh, <laughs> cook, cook. <laughs> this is Luce. It's actually, did you know that three color cats are very rare and they, um, they're a sign of luck? I didn't know. Yeah. Ah, okay. And they're almost always female. Yeah, they're, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Only oh, female. Oh. Be so pretty. Yeah. Our pet expert does also know cats. I'm impressed. Uh, I didn't know. So he's a My friend cat, told me last a week. Cat's bird. <laughs> <Cat's bird. laughs> well, I had a cat oh, okay. once upon a time. Yeah.
um, and um, I'm oh, looking to the camera. That, uh, the camera. That, for instance, next time um, when we discuss further on, and we probably touch also leadership and the challenges in leadership, because I have a gut feeling that you have an opinion on um, where in CX projects females might have an fair or unfair advantage in being a bit more successful than their male um, counterparts. That's something interesting to discuss on. Yeah, I will have my thoughts oh, yeah. until then. Uh, hold, 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 hold them back. Sure. Hold them back. <laughs> the yeah, yeah, I will, I will. And raise appetize where our audience. Yeah. Um, there's more to come. Watch yes, that space. I'll be back. Exactly. <laughs> well, and if anyone is interested in, I had a few people from um, English speaking region. Um, I, I launched this um, custom experience project management course in German, and there are quite a few people that were interested. And uh, we're having it in the pipeline. So soon to come, um, we're going to start the, the course in English too. So if anyone is interested, just hop on to the CX Hero School and sign up and you're going to get informed as soon and as we launch this On behalf you. of my fellow ignorant countrymen, I thank you. And <laughs> um, aside of that, and I don't go for the ignorance or the Trumpism, I go for simply the opportunity of um, answering a questionnaire, get something for free as a grateful thank you, and raise um, the level of knowledge about yourself, where you're standing, and give uh, feedback to Annika and their teams um, in the way of how to make an even more compelling approach to support your next CX initiatives. Wow. I didn't, I, I didn't <coughs> learn it by heart. I just did it out of the free fall. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, that would be great. I would be very thankful. Um, on on her profile, you find the link for that questionnaires. I shared it in my LinkedIn profile, and um, we're happy to put something into the posts when we re-promote for cool. later viewing. Um, also, these to get the advantage of not only on a birthday. To get something for free but even make it a give and take situation you fill out the questionnaire and you get something lovely back yeah uh it's actually a knowledge boost on customer centricity so very fitting to the topic as i realized as i answered the questionnaire and i was overwhelmed oh thank you so much <laughs> Okay. Okay. Shall we save something before, for next time? Before, before we start clapping our shoulders too much, <laughs> we go back. Oh, let's, let, let, let's say thanks to everybody who is still there, and there are still some people there. <laughs> See you next time. We are going backstage now for continuing to give praises to each other. <laughs> exactly. Don't do it publicly. <laughs>